Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this panel discussion of this powerful movie, Hunger Award. I'm Diane Randall. I am the General Secretary of the Friends Committee on National Legislation, and we are sponsoring this viewing and discussion. We have a fabulous panel. Um, I want to let you know that uh, you're joining us on a very historic day, and I'm guessing that most of you have followed the news that today President Biden announced that the United States would suspend offensive uh, su uh, action support for Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates in their war against Saudi Ar against Yemen. This uh, is a, a, a real victory for all of us who have worked for years to try to end US complicity in this war. We are going to talk about all of that throughout the next 45 minutes. Um, and I want to let you know that uh, you are invited to in ask questions that we will offer to our panelists so that they can address them um, as we get into a discussion. Um, so I wanna just announce who's joining me tonight and then we're gonna hear from Sky Fitzgerald. Uh, Sky Fitzgerald is the filmmaker uh, for this uh, really powerful film that we're seeing and you'll see a little bit of information about him. Uh, Dr. Aisha Juman is also joining us. Uh, Dr. Juman works with the Yemen Relief and Reconstruction Foundation and is just a font of information about all things Yemen. Uh, very exciting to have her. And my colleague, Hassan El Tayab, who is our Middle East uh, lobbyist and who has uh, came to work with us uh, probably about three years ago or two years ago and just with a real um, compassion to advocate on this issue with Congress. So I'm really thrilled to have this group of uh, three with us tonight to answer your questions and to engage in this conversation on this historic day. Before we turn to the politics and the policy of this, which is so important, I wanna ask Sky to talk to us a little bit about the film. Uh, I know that when I watched the film, it was so moving and so deeply powerful. Um, so just maybe to take a breath and think about what we saw uh, on the screen. Tell us about what drew you to make this film, uh, Sky, and, and what was your experience in creating it? Yeah, thank, thanks for that. Um, you know, it, it was in some ways just a very simple, essential question that I asked myself. And it was how how can a child die from hunger in in 2020 in 2021 um, with all of the resources that we have globally uh, on this planet? You know, how is it that um, a, a 10 year old child like we show in the film can weigh 24 pounds, or a six year old weigh 15 pounds? And and um, I wanted to sort of try to answer that question, um, the how of it. Um, you know, I, I'm, per, on a personal level, I am really consistently frustrated over the years with this whole idea of compassion fatigue that exists, you know, that, that we hear enough statistics, we see enough um, horrible images, um, you know, we hear that 100,000 children can die due to acute malnutrition in Yemen, you know, that's a staggering idea, right, to get your head around. Um, but I've always believed in the power of the individual story and the power of the individual. And I believe that if we can understand on a deeper level what these stats mean, they help us care about the people involved. Because I deeply believe we ought to care about a 10-year-old who weighs 24 pounds, mm -hmm. right? And we should be horrified that that exists in this world today. So really, um, you know, my hope in making the film at its core was to try to create an empathy machine, you know, a vehicle for understanding and compassion that hopefully would lead to action um, and to end US military support to the war in Yemen, frankly, and, and to start marshalling the resources to go to the civilians who are most deeply affected by the conflict. Hmm. It's really a film um, that does evoke a sense of compassion, but it also is a film that calls for peace. and. I think that's really, really compelling in, in how you tell the story. Um, the, the images of um, these children um, will stay with all of us, I think. Um, they're uh, just the depth of their eyes, uh, the sort of what they're experiencing. 
but also the experiences of their parents, their families who, who are in such deep grief um, and the kind of tenacity of these, uh, um, of the doctor and nurse who are profiled in this. Um, can you say anything about how you, how you met them, how you came to, to, uh, to film them and then also how, how, if you've been able to follow up at all with, with this work? Yeah, um, so it, it came out of a lot of um, long-term research and um, conversations and relationship building over a relatively long period of time. Um, I, you know, this, this film actually is the third in a trilogy about displacement, the larger idea of displacement. Um, and um, so I was sort of studying this as a potential topic for the third film in the trilogy and, and um, was just deeply disturbed by our own country's involvement in the conflict and how, how complicit we were, but, but by the deep and abiding impact of the war on your average citizen in Yemen, right? Um, not only displaced peoples, but, but um, throughout the country. And so um, as I did that research, you know, these two healthcare facilities kept coming up over and over again in conversation. Sadaka Hospital in Aden, um, and then um, Makia Maji's clinic uh, in the north, in the Houthi-held rebel area. And um, the more I learned about them, and as we sort of deepened the conversations um, through our colleagues, it just became clear that they were doing this heroic work, mm -hmm. um, nearly unheralded, um, because they believed so deeply that this is, this is what they, they wanted and needed to devote their lives to saving children's lives, right, in the midst of this conflict. And I always think that even in the most desperate of circumstances, you know, there's beauty. Um, and I, I think there's beauty in the work of Makia, and there's beauty in the work of Aida. And, and I wanted to showcase that, because I think that's, that generates hope, right? That generates hope that shows the individual can and change things, right? Can save a life over and over again, day in and day out. And I think if we see that enough, it engenders hope in us and it, it reinforces our own um, thinking that we also can do something. So um, that was the general approach to it. Um, and once I met them, I just, I was even further committed to making sure that I covered their work with as much respect and dignity as possible. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing your process. And, and um, at the toward the end of our discussion, we're going to talk a little bit more about how um, if people who are, are viewing this want to know more about how they may share the film. Um, I think Sky's going to talk to us a little bit about that. But I want to turn now to uh, Dr. Aisha Juman. Um, this is uh, um, your work. This is your work um, to address this humanitarian crisis, and you have done so much to educate people about the country, about the crisis that is going on, about this war. Um, what can you tell us about this, the, what's happening now in terms of um, civilian um, tragedy, tragedy, but also the issue of famine, of hunger in Yemen? Thank you very much, uh, Dan. And thank you, Sky, for also um, sharing the movie with the American public. When, uh, when I saw the movie, I, I was heartbroken. Um, I cried. I couldn't see the whole thing in, in one sitting. It, it's very challenging for me. Um, it's also very hard because the families you featured represent people I personally know. When the woman cried because her daughter died or um, when they are rushing a child to a clinic, I know these people. I know many people like these people. So it's really touched um, a raw emotions that have been trying to suppress since the war um, started on the people of Yemen. Uh, the, what you presented were a few cases of 16.2 million Yemeni who are suffering exactly the same thing. And I just want to put this in perspective. Uh, the population of Florida is about 18 million. Imagine if the whole population of Florida is experiencing famine. That's exactly what's going on in Yemen. And we, as U.S. Uh, taxpayers, contributed to that. Uh, the effect of famine and malnutrition, uh, 
um, as a public health professional, I know the effect is going to be long term. It's not something that once we feed these kids, they're going to be fine. I know that the effect is going to stunt their uh, physical as well as mental and cognitive development. And Yemen will have to deal with this for many years to come. It weakens their immune system, which means they're more likely to be um, at risk for infectious diseases. And we've seen a lot of outbreaks. So it's not just the famine, but it feeds into a lot of infections. We have the largest cholera outbreak in the world. Like you said, in the 21st century with over 2 million cases, Yemen has not had diphtheria since 1918. Now we have a diphtheria outbreak. We have a measles outbreak. We have dengue outbreak. We have just so many outbreaks because people's immune system, these kids' immune systems have been uh, compromised by the famine. The other thing that I also want to add is there are 20 million people in Yemen who are in need of humanitarian assistance. That's equivalent to the whole population of New York State. Imagine that. And the final thing I want to add on this topic is that this is a man-made crisis and that it can be ended by a political decision. And today's announcement by President Biden is a step in the right direction, but it's only the first step. Thank you. It, it is only the first step, but you started answering the next question I wanted to ask, which is, what, what can people do? I mean, what can we hear? I mean, we're, we're joined tonight by people all over the world, uh, but certainly here in the United States or in North America, what, what can we do? There are a lot of things people can do. Uh, one of the things that we've been working on through Yemen Relief and the Construction Foundation with a lot of partners is advocacy. We need our congressional uh, representatives in both the Senate and the House to know that we are against this war. We're against of creating famine. We're against having children die because of communicable diseases, that they shouldn't be dying off in this time and age. Uh, people can also, uh, right now we actually can call the White House. Uh, call the White House, tell them what you think because they're gonna to listen to you. I think it's crucial that we do that. We need to support uh, the Yemeni um, under the previous administration, aid was cut to the Northern part of Yemen where 80% of the population lives. We need to call on them to uh, restore aid because the US set actually uh, example. So when the US cuts aid, other organizations and other countries also cut aid to Yemen. So that is a very important point for us, is for the U.S. to step up the support so other countries will also follow suit. The other thing that is happening and not a lot of people are talking about it is the blockade on Yemen. Uh, I would like people to, again, uh, impress on the representatives and on the White House um, that we need to lift the blockade on Yemen. I'm gonna share a very personal story about the blockade. My sister who was suffering from breast cancer, um, cancer returned in 2018. Of course, we, Sanaa airport is closed. We couldn't uh, do a medical evacuation for her. But um, I was able through, of course, contacts to be, uh, to purchase medicine for her. It took us many months to be able to get the medicine to her. By the time it got to Sana'a, it had to go through Djibouti and from Djibouti to Sana'a. By the time it got to Sana'a, she no longer needed it. Jamila passed a few months after that. That's one story of a lot of people who are experiencing the same thing. Jamila was lucky because she had a family that could, she had a home that she lived in. She had a family that cared for her and we could buy her the medicine, which we eventually donated to other people. There are millions in Yemen who cannot afford any of that. So I would love for people to act um, and end with the suffering of the Yemeni people. Please donate to any organization that you think 
uh, will support Yemen. There are a lot of great organizations. Um, we also do a lot of relief work in Yemen. Um, if you wish to donate to us, we'll be very happy uh, and grateful for that. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, thank you for sharing that very uh, powerful personal story. Uh, it, it, like the stories in the film, when we hear the direct experiences of people, it, it makes a tremendous difference. And your uh, encouragement of people to talk to the White House, to talk to their members of Congress is completely in line with how Friends Committee on National Legislation does um, our work and our advocacy. Um, we have, um, I think, some powerful lobbyists who, who are working for peace and for justice. And I'm so thrilled that Hassan uh, is joining us, one of those powerful lobbyists who is going to talk now about um, this work that, that so many people have done to try to convince their members of Congress, but also uh, with the work with the Biden White House. Um, I will say, I think everyone is probably aware of this, this uh, change of administration and the new Congress um, is a new era and we have new opportunities. Um, and talking to Congress and working with Congress is extremely important. We cannot simply rest on this announcement today. Hassan, tell us what's happening. You interpret the announcement in relation to what is going on in Congress. Thank you so much, Diane, uh, for your leadership at FCNL. Thank you to Sky for this incredible film. It, it's, just, it's just so well done and so beautiful. And I'm just so pleased that you've shared this with us. And special thank to my, <laughs> my, my dear friend Aisha and for that story. I, it just, it's just been such an honor to work with you and to know you over these pa past few years. <laughs> you know, um, there was a major announcement today. Uh, it really was, and I, I just want to tell people how this happened, <laughs> what it is, and what it's not. Um, this happened, I, I applaud President Biden, but this happened because of people like Dr. Aisha Juman. This happened because of tens of thousands of activists all over the, all over the country led by Yemeni Americans and faith groups and, and grassroots groups. I'm sure a lot of people on this call, uh, on this Zoom chat, uh, did a lot of work. People that wrote their senators, wrote their uh, representatives, you know, was standing out in the rain uh, at rallies in in the cold. And and if if nothing else, this shows that when we come together and that we prioritize peace and we prioritize putting Yemeni voices out front of that movement, uh, we can make huge historic changes. I I, I think it's really. It just been incredible to see this real sea change. I remember when I first got to D.C. and even before that, I would meet with members and and they wouldn't even know about Yemen. They, they didn't know about the Yemen war. They didn't, you know, uh, you know, I, I remember talking to a lot of people and they were like, we'll never be able to end support for the Saudi coalition. Like, don't, you know, don't even try. Like, what are you thinking? And we just kept doing it. And the more and more we shared this witness, and shared our stories and, and shared uh, the stories of Yemenis who, who are people that we loved and cared about, uh, the more more people came on board and there's now a sea change. Well, we got Congress to force several votes uh, in the House and Senate to cut off uh, weapon sales and to cut off support for the coalition. And that momentum we lost, you know, we lost uh, several of those votes, uh, but we kept trying. We kept forcing these members and urging the members to to keep at it. And uh, in 2019, we finally passed a Yemen War Powers resolution to you know to to end support for the Saudi UAE led coalition's war in Yemen. And you know, as many of the folks on this call know, we were supplying the the intel sharing, the targeting assistance, spare parts transfers, billions in weapon sales. And we kept forcing these votes till we had a bipartisan, bicameral majorities uh, that wanted to end support for the war. That was hugely important. Trump vetoed that resolution, but it, it led the way for this announcement that we saw today. So let's talk about the announcement. They, uh, President Biden said at the State Department today around 
3 o'clock Eastern, that they were going to end offensive, you know, U.S. support for offensive operations in Yemen. Now, this is a really historic announcement, but we don't really have all the details yet. And so that's why our activism is still needed. And I've heard from my sources that they're still actually trying to figure out what some of the definitions are of offensive operations. Um, what I interpret that to mean is an end to uh, you know, mid-era fueling, which supposedly had already ended in 2018, an end to the intel sharing, targeting assistance, spare parts transfers. They announced an end to uh, you know, weapons that could be used for offensive operations. That would be the precision guided munitions. I would also add, you know, add the F-35 sales to the, to the UAE and Reaper drones, but we don't have a real definition of whether or not they're interpreting that uh, as you know, offensive. Uh, we don't know what defensive means. <laughs> you know, so that's another thing we have to really figure out. Um, and one thing I am really excited about is that there was an announcement that there would be a permanent envoy to Yemen to help bring about a diplomatic solution to the crisis. And to me, that signals that the administration right now is putting a line in the sand and saying, we're, we're committed to getting this done, getting a ceasefire deal. And so that's hugely important. And not just for what the U.S. is going to do, but it sends a signal to all the, all the allies that we have around the world, the U.K., France, Canada, and others, that now there's some pressure on them to also end their support. And, you know, this is an international man-made crisis, as Aisha mentioned. So, you know, we still have a lot to do, but I think, I hope that kind of explains a little bit about where we're at and, and maybe where we need to go. Um, Diane, did you want me to say a little bit about what what's next? <laughs> yeah, I do want to say that. I just want to I just want to note, as I did earlier, that we do have some uh, some friends from Canada on the call, and you know, there there's clearly work to do in every government that is supporting this war. And so, you know, our focus right now is on the United States. That's where we can lobby, and you know, we really do encourage people to contact their own members of Congress on this. And we have an action alert, actually, and that I think. Hassan's going to talk a little bit about about what the next steps are. I, I do want to just observe that you know you're. Thank you for bringing up the issue of the envoy because one of the changes that's happened with this administration is you know we're back we're back in the conversation about multilateralism. We're back in a conversation about diplomacy. We're back rebuilding the State Department and, and the U.S. Uh, AID. And so um, there you know we we have. We had regressed so far that there's so much that we have to do to restore even where we were, but um, there are new opportunities. Um, but I, I do, I, I also just, Hassan, you use the term bicameral, bipartisan support. It's just not something we hear about a lot of legislation. So so hone in on that a bit in terms of where we go next with, with what politically has to happen. Yeah, thank you so much. and. Uh, for folks that don't know, bicameral is House and Senate, um, and bipartisan means Republicans and Democrats working together. How, how did we get this to happen? You know, we appealed to a lot of libertarian Republicans and Republicans that did care about constitutional war authority. The war was never authorized by Congress, meaning there was never a vote or a debate uh, since, since the start in 2015. And we got to be able to build out some support in the Republican Party and with the Democrats, you know, a lot of arguments about the humanitarian crisis really resonated. And so we found common ground and were, was able to get this done. Um, my, so my feeling is that we need to keep engaging and Congress needs to be a part of this conversation. An executive order is just that. It's an order from the executive. It's not necessarily a law that's binding. If there's another president that comes in in four to eight years, or even if this administration decides that it's now time to start supporting the war in Yemen, that they, they could actually just like a flip a switch and we could start supporting the coalition again. I don't think that's going to happen, but I, I like insurance. I have, you know, I, I, so what I think we should be doing and what FCNL is calling for is that we should get Congress to pass a Yemen war powers resolution to, to make this a law that cannot be reversed and to put, you know, in this law, all of the U.S. support that we've been providing to the coalition, everything I mentioned before. So that's step one is to try to make sure that we get this, you know, bound into law. 
Uh, we also, I have uh, some news that the House Foreign Affairs Committee is considering new legislation to, to more permanently block weapon sales to the UAE and Saudi Arabia. And I think that's really significant as well. Um, you know, there was uh, a $23 billion weapon sale to Saudi Arabia that was pushed through during the lame duck in December by the Trump administration. And so that would be, you know, I think that's all on the table. It, you know, the UAE has been a main driver of the violence in Yemen, and that those weapon sales send exactly the wrong signal. And, and the $800 million weapon sale to Saudi Arabia as well should also be stopped. Uh, again, you know, this, these are drones. These are, you know, F-35s, these, like, massive planes, really expensive planes, um, and precision-guided munitions that are the bombs that we're dropping. Uh, so those two pieces are really important. I'm just going to name a couple more things that Congress can do. Congress, you know, has the power of the purse, so they can restore and expand humanitarian aid to all parts of Yemen. Aisha mentioned a suspension in susp uh, a suspension in humanitarian assistance to northern Yemen or the Houthi-held territory where 80% of the population lives. So we need to end the suspension of aid and make sure we restore and expand to all parts of Yemen. Um, we need to get members to publicly call out the blockade that, you know, heart, the story I should just told is just heartbreaking. And that's, ha that's not a unique story right now. The blockade is devastating this country. And we need to put pressure on the coalition to end, uh, end this blockade. And, you know, we don't have, you know, necessarily proof that U.S. military support is you know supporting the blockade but there's a lot of things if you read between the lines when you know the u.s inter intercepts you know iranian vessels or you know it, you know there's a lot of reason to believe that the u.s is participating in the blockade and, and you know so that's something else that needs to end um, and last but not least we need to lift this fto designation we, we absolutely have to. This is the foreign terrorist organization designation on the Houthis. And members of Congress can make public statements and they can reach out to the administration calling on them to lift this designation that's really blocking the ability for humanitarian aid workers like Aisha and others to do their critical work because, you know, they, there's a big fear that they're going to get penalized. Uh, or, you know, there could be legal penalties, financial penalties, and, and that's... You know, it's already hard enough to do this critical work uh, uh, to, you know, support the people of Yemen without this FTO designation. So those are just some of the steps. There is more, but I think for our for our network and our grassroots activism, those are really key points that we can focus on. Thank you, Hassan. You are such a font of information about what people can do. I, I love it. Um, we are, I hope people are paying attention to the chat because we're posting uh both some articles that I think you're going to find interesting, uh, links to, to websites, uh, links to our action alert, but we're also getting questions. And I want to pose this question uh, to Dr. Juman. Others may have an answer too, but this is another heartbreaking story um, from Mahar, Mahar Al Baradi. I am a Yemeni nurse living in Wisconsin. I also had uncles that died, one from a bomb of a potato chips factory, another with the lack of medicine due to the blockade. They all left behind nearly a dozen kids. The orphans are really struggling. How could we make sure that reparations are paid for the genocide committed? This is a war crime. Are there any effort to sue these people for war crimes? I'm sorry, Maher, for your loss and the loss of many lives in Yemen. Uh, this is something that's going to be very challenging, uh, but I hope with the new administration, we're going to get some uh, closure to a lot of the wrongs that were done against the Yemeni people. I'll just share some examples of that were blocked um, in the UN for asking uh, the Saudi UAE to be accountable for their war crimes in Yemen. Um, Holland um, came in with uh, a resolution that they wanted independent investigation into war crimes in Yemen by all parties. Um, and unfortunately, the US and the UK, and here I need to call in the UK, blocked that resolution and didn't allow it to go through. Uh, the other three times were when the UN for children blacklisted the Saudi Arabia for killing Yemeni children. 
three times the Saudi uh, threatened the UN that they will stop uh, funding them for cru crucial programs. And three times they were taken off the list, uh, what they call the shame list of countries that kill uh, children. I'm hopeful that with the pressure that we build um, and the advocacy that we do, that all war crimes committed against the many people will be, uh, people who committed them will be accountable, will be held accountable. But it will take us um, raising this issue um, and insisting that this is one of our demands, because without that, it's, it's not gonna happen. Um, I know the Saudis purposefully have um, targeted all food sources in Yemen. So whether it's a potato chip company, whether it's a chicken farm, whether it's an animal farm, um, pomegranate farms, and that was, in my mind, was purposeful starvation of the, the population in Yemen. So in addition to the blockade that would not allow uh, things to come in and also destroy the economy and the ability of people to earn a living, they also targeted food sources in Yemen, throughout Yemen. Um, I also would share here a personal story because my parents have uh, two of the largest uh, chicken hatcheries in Yemen, both were bombed. They were not in any area where there are, where is active fighting. They were not in an area where they would claim that they were arms being, um, you know, uh, stored. They were just in an open area and they bombed both of them. And they bombed a lot of chicken farms, a lot of animal farms, as I said. They bombed even the WF, the World Food Program storage. Of, of food. So it's something that uh, at the, they, they've intended for that to happen. And I do hope with the new laws that says, you know, creating famine is a war crime, that people hold them uh, accountable to that. You know, as a, as a Quaker, it's really, um, we, we, we absolutely eschew violence of any kind. And it's very, very awful to just imagine the, the destruction and death that has happened in Yemen. One of the questions that we had is, why has the US supported Saudi Arabia and UAE? Why has this support even existed? Um, I, I don't know whether one of, I, does anyone want to take that question? Hassan, do you want to jump in? I don't want to, but I will. <laughs> and Aisha or Sky, if I miss anything, please feel free to jump in. Um, so U.S.-Saudi relations have gone back decades. It started with FDR and King Abdulaziz, you know, shaking hands in the Suez Canal in the 40s. And there was an exchange where we would provide security assistance and they would provide fossil fuels tied to the US dollar. And, that, and that's just been the pact that's been you know, agreed to and, and president after president over the decades have just accepted that that's the reality. Um, in 2015, at the start of the Yemen war, Obama, President Obama at that time was also negotiating the Iran nuclear deal which is something else that is a major priority for FCNL. We're trying to restore diplomacy with Iran, uh, make sure Iran doesn't have a nuclear weapon or is developing nuclear materials. And, you know, uh, in exchange for lifting horrible humanitarian sanctions on the country that has just been devastating the population there. Um, and what, what happened is that Obama basically made this this deal with the Saudis to try to, you know, get them to not be as vocally opposed to the Iran nuclear deal. And that was part of the calculation is that, you know, we're going to, you know, provide support for the, the coalition, and they're going to be a little bit less vocally opposed to the Iran nuclear deal. And unfortunately, um, it's just turned out horribly. It's it been an absolute disaster. And, um, you know, that's that's sort of the background. There's, there's definitely more to it, but in a nutshell, I think that's that's the story. Yeah, if I could add something, Diane, um, I think, um, you know, there's, I think we have to really pull back sometimes 
and 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 look at in a different way what Aisha had to say as well. Just so moving, you know. Um, Article 14 of the uh, 14 of the Geneva Conventions has an explicit definition of starvation as a tool uh, in combat being prohibited, and that's just a you know that's not a direct quote, but that's the paraphrase of it, and that it defines it as a war crime, and you know clearly the air blockade as well as the other efforts by the Saudi coalition to destroy you know um, chicken farms and to prevent um, foodstuffs from arriving in Houthi held areas in a regular, in a, in a timely fashion, it is using starvation as a tool of war. And so my view is that, that we have a moral imperative here, right? Um, history is not going to um, define us well if, if we don't act with the full force of all of our resources to end our complicity in this war because there are war crimes that have been committed and continue to be committed even on this day where this executive order is going to be issued. And, and I think um, it's upon us to push to make sure that it's followed through on. And more importantly, to make sure that one of the things that happens as quickly as possible is, is that this air blockade is ended, right? Because otherwise, you know, Aisha's friend in addition to her sister is going to die, right? And many other innocent civilians are going to die because the blockade is in place and it's clearly illegal. And, and that I think is one of the next concrete steps that we really have to you know, um, go after our own senators and Congress to change. Um, I am sorry to tell you that we are coming to the discussion. Um, we have a few minutes left and there are some really fantastic questions coming in, um, including a little bit more asking for some analysis of the Houthi situation. But I, I do want to, I want to come back to the blockade question because there was a specific question. I want to ask uh, Dr. Juman, is, is any relief able to get in to this point or has the blockade really um, basically made it impossible? No, relief is going through Yemen through uh, international agencies. However, it's under the Saudi-led uh, control. So the ports in Hodeida, for example, is under their control in, in a sense, is there is a UN system that inspects ships that go into Yemen, but the Saudis will decide after the UN certification that the ship can go into Yemen, the Saudi decide whether it goes into Yemen or not. Hmm. So the UN has established what they call uh, commodity tracking for Yemen to show after they get a certificate, how many actually do go to Yemen and how many are diverted to Jeddah and Saudi Arabia. So shipping to Yemen is quite expensive because ships may stay in a Saudi port for over 200 days before they're allowed to go into Yemen. Mm -hmm. And in the last, and since June, the fuel ships that are going to Yemen, uh, the amount that's been allowed is 1% of Yemen, what Yemen needs. So there are huge, uh, shortages in fuel, and it impacts everything from hospitals to delivery of food to everything that is, is you know, imagine if we don't have fuel here in the US. So yeah, um, they only allow what they want to allow. And the fact that we have a tracking system that you establish to track what's allowed into Yemen is actually um, heartbreaking for me. I'm gonna um, go in the order that we started and ask each of our panelists to make remarks um, about um, their just final remarks on this. Um, I, I would like to ask um, Sky, uh, you had there are a couple of questions. One was about um, just the process of getting into Yemen to, to film this and um, there were, um, you know, what kind of response you had from the hospitals and others to do it, if you could remark briefly on that. And also a great question is, you know, what is your sense of the impact of this film? What, what has changed because of it? Um, love to hear you remark on that as you, as you, and then tell us about, about access to the film, if people are interested in, in sharing it with their own groups. Yeah, um, so, so I'll answer that quickly. Um, so we, um, people can reach out via hungerward.org and just query us. Um, we're, we're in conversations with distributors now for a broad public release, but I can't really speak to those details in terms of timetable. It will be released um, broadly in 2021. But if you reach out to us via the website, we're happy to set up 
um, virtual screenings like this in the meantime. In terms of getting access to the story, it was not easy. Um, it took um, eight, eight to nine months to gain permission to film in the country. And we had a parallel track where we had to work with both um, the internationally recognized government um, in, in Riyadh, <laughs> um, ironically, as well as with the Houthi groups. And so we had a parallel visa process that we had to go through because we knew we wanted to film uh, the same topic in both parts of the country. Um, in terms of um, working with the clinics, um, doctors and nurses, they absolutely want this story told. And the de facto authorities in the South really don't, right? Because it, it's the Saudi coalition which is blocking access um, to these sorts of stories getting out because the more they do get out, right? Hopefully the more people will care. And the more people that care, the more people will act. And so there was incredible resistance just getting in, but, but in the clinics themselves, I was amazed at, at how much they wanted this story to get out um, and to participate, frankly. Um, so that was a, a huge gift and it was a, a deep and abiding collaboration throughout the process. Thank you. Thank you for your tenacity in, in making the film. Um, Dr. Duman, what's, what's tomorrow and the day after and the next few weeks and months look like at the Yemen uh, Relief and Reconstruction Foundation? Where do we go from here? We will continue our advocacy. That's our number one um, aim. Um, again, with congressional uh, staff, with the White House, with our partners, uh, Hassan has been an amazing partner. Um, and uh, as I said uh, in a chat, we have over 380 organizations that are supporting our efforts to end the war in Yemen. We will continue to provide support. Uh, Yemen Relief and Reconstruction Foundation has access to inaccessible places because we work with Yemeni volunteers who live in these areas. And we will continue to um, advocate for peace those are our three aims. That's why I established Yemen Relief in the first place, and we'll continue to make sure that our aims and objectives are met. Thank you. I just want to note that um, Dr. Jaman speaks in many uh, venues, and she shared as we were preparing for this uh, some of the background information, which is very rich indeed and thorough. And so if, if uh, people are interested in, in a further exploration of the topic, uh, she would be a great speaker. Uh, Hassan, um, what, what, where, where do we go at FCNL and how do we keep people connected, engaged and passionate about talking to their members of Congress? That's a great question. Um, uh, I, I think people need to see that what we accomplished here as far as getting President Biden to sign an executive order on ending offensive operations is historic that only happened because of grassroots activism and you know to keep this momentum going more grassroots activism is needed i would really urge people you know go to fcnl's site you know sign up for our email list we have action alerts uh you know reach out to you know so many grassroots organizations that have been doing some of this work, you know, reach out to your member of Congress, make sure that they're on board with ending support for the Yemen war and doing all the things we mentioned here. Um, make sure that your community has seen this film. <laughs> you know, absolutely. I think, you know, telling the story of Yemen is a huge part of the solution. Um, and, and, you know, make sure you're writing on use Twitter, social media, LTEs, op-eds, letters to the editor, um, and just keep speaking out. And, you know, I think in the next few months, it's just going to be really critical that we sustain this activism. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's just been such an amazing journey uh, to work with so many wonderful activists. And I, you know, looking forward to keeping it going. I'm not slowing down at all. D Diane, Diane, I have to intervene here just to give a shout out to Friends Committee um, because uh, you're, you and your entire organization is a huge part of this civil society movement. And we feel so blessed as a, as a film production team to have you and IH's organization to partner with because it is making a difference. And, um, you know, I don't know if you know this, but the last film, the second film in this trilogy, that Hunger Words of Food, you know, we focused on uh, 
a sea captain who um, was was a Quaker, was of the Quaker faith. And so there seems to be sort of a confluence of effort here that's very organic in nature. So thank you for your continued uh, peace building efforts year in and year out. Well, thank you. And um, we, it's an honor to work with, with, with all of you. Um, I, and I just want to second um, uh, Hassan's invitation to come to the FCNL website. Um, we do work on many peace issues for peace, for justice, and uh, for addressing climate change. And so, um, and, and we really, um, we love training people to build relationships with members of Congress because we do believe it is essential for us to be in dialogue. And so um, join us whenever you can. Uh, thank you so much for this. What a touching, uh, and uh, that's not even the adequate word. What a profound uh, conversation we've had and what an opportunity we have to really be all builders of peace by pressing forward on this um, historic day to, to assure that the violence will end and the humanitarian crisis will be alleviated um, and we will not be seeing children starving and civilians killed. So thank you for joining us. Thank you.